senior pastor, founder of Epiphany Fellowship, and president of Thriving and founder of Thriving, and also um, curator of this series uh, called The Woke Church, The Woke Church video series. And I have a very, very, very special guest and dear friend of my family and leader in our local church. And she's a therapist and she has two doctorate degrees, a JD and a PhD. Her name is Dr. Sarita Lyons. How you doing, sister? I'm good. Thank you for having me. Glad, glad you're here. We're here today uh, because um, our families um, fellowship together sometimes and we were just hanging out. And I don't know how it came up, but we began, began talking about her testimony. And um, as she began telling me her testimony, I was like, I didn't know this. In light of what's going on, I felt like a lot of people need to know about someone that actually was influenced by West African religions and Kemet and who was deeply entrenched in it, came out of, grew in, grew up in the church, went into it in college, and then somehow the Lord brought her out. I want to read something before we begin. I ain't trying to get preachy, but I want to read something and just give her a chance to share. I'll give her open windows to talk and I'll ask some questions, but really this is about her sharing her testimony and then really encouraging somebody out there that's either you're wrestling with the faith while you're in the church, you've left the church and you're wrestling with the faith because of this, but then, or you have either abandoned the church altogether or you never were Christian or never were in the realm of Christianity ever. And you believe that Christianity is the white man's religion and that original religions come out of Africa. And we want to, just, we're not trying to beat you up, uh, but we do have, we, we want to talk about some of the spiritual dangers of some of these religions. And um, in Deuteronomy chapter 18, uh, it says, when you enter the land which the Lord your God gives you, you shall not learn to imitate the detestable things of those nations. Now, when I read that, I'm not saying that Africa is detestable. So I do not want you to run away from this video calling me a coon because that's not what the Bible is saying and that's not what I'm saying, okay? It says, there shall not be found among you anyone who makes his own son or his daughter pass through the fire, one who uses divination, one who practices witchcraft, or one who interprets omens, or a sorcerer, or one who casts a spell, or a medium, or a spiritualist, or spiritist rather, or one who calls up the dead. For whoever does these things is detestable to the Lord, and the Lord, and because of these detestable things, the Lord your God will drive them out before you. You shall be blameless before the Lord. Um, you know, as we as we look at this, and as I read this passage, one of the things that we are tackling today is the fact that. A lot of people are rightly wanting to search their ethnic heritage to find significance, dignity, and identity, particularly African Americans who are in this sector of the Western world. But then secondly, in light of that reality, one of the things that we've experienced is people in the church doubting Christianity uh, because of its cultural captivity in the Western world uh, to, to, the, to the whitewashing of evangelicalism that seems more uh, culturally connected and culturally captive uh, to conservatism versus Jesus Christ. And so, uh, and so some people don't know how to divorce biblical Christianity from whitewashed Western European Christianity and therefore want to do some historical and spiritual etymology of their history and go back a bit and begin to say, yo, what was I before this? And so I want to give you the floor, sis. Um, you know, talk, talk about your upbringing. Yeah. And as you talk about your upbringing, um, talk about your transition to college. Sure. We'll just start there. Okay. Yeah, I think talking about my upbringing is important because I probably was the church girl poster child mm. growing up. Yeah. And the least likely, from all outside appearance, the appearance is the least likely person that you would expect to get involved in mystery cults and mm -hmm. um, African religions and things like that. So I grew up in a Christian family, two parent home, mom and dad. My father is a preacher and associate pastor and minister at a church, um, have been in church my entire life. Mm -hmm. uh, my father was called into the ministry after I was born. Yeah. So I didn't initially grow up with him um, ministering in that way. But I just always felt um, a very strong 
love for the Lord. Mm -hmm. uh, very early on, some memories I have, others my parents tell me um, that when I was in grade school, the uh, school was calling, parents were calling my parents because you know, their, their children were saying, my daughter says she can't go to sleep until she does Sarita's Bible study homework. Because in grade school, I was giving out Bible study homework and having Bible study during recess. Wow. And then in public school, I'm passing out tracts wow. and evangelizing. Almost got kicked out of school for, you know, the whole separation of church yeah, and state yeah, issue. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I had a very strong sense of God being my savior. And my Lord um, accepted the Lord at the age of 12. I remember having n not a conversion experience off of a message, but at home believing that I was supposed to be baptized and give my life to Christ. So I had planned to walk down, give my hand to the preacher and my heart to the Lord <laughs> um, and just did well in school. And I think I was like a model church kid. I mean, I did all the Easter plays and Christmas plays and memorized scripture and I, from all outside appearances, seem to be, for my age even, someone very devoted and committed to mm -hmm. God. Yeah. Um, and so when I went to college, I went to Florida A&M University, mm -hmm. FAMU, HBCU. <laughs> and um, it was a great experience. And interestingly enough, I said I knew I didn't want to go to a white school because I felt like I would be protesting and you know, not getting an education. And I ended up doing all my crazy stuff at the, <laughs> at the black college. Um, but when I got on campus, I, um, I started to be, honestly, I started to get turned off a little bit by um, the sororities and fraternities. My mom was a Delta, is a Delta, my dad is a Kappa. And I always thought I was gonna do the same thing. But I, I started thinking like, somebody's gonna beat on me so I can become their sister. So I became very anti kind of sororities and fraternities. And KA size and non hers and fraternity. I'm sorry, go ahead. <laughs> so, so, but in kind of having a, an opinion about that, I ended up getting connected to people who agreed, and that would be what you would call at that time kind of the conscious community. Yeah. So I remember very early on doing panels about why black people should pledge Greek and all that, but I developed kind of a, a relationship and friendship with people who were kind of of that mind, should I say. Interestingly enough, which is why I'm so happy to even do this, um, especially when I think about women, but women and men, how I ended up having the door open for me for um, Egyptology and Yoruba religions is I had a breakup with a boyfriend in college and I think I was like, oh, I'm gonna marry this guy and you know, felt a heartbreak after the loss and a girlfriend of mine said, oh, you need to go talk to these people. You know, they'll counsel you, they'll help you. So I ended up going to a center in Tallahassee um, that was very well known for being very conscious and committed to African culture, and they were also counselors. And so it started off just as kind of having like a father figure, a mother figure, wrap their arms around me and coach me up out of my sadness over a breakup. And for the very first time, I'm hearing things like, you know, um, you deserve better and in, in, in terms of the relationship, you're a queen. Um, and felt a lot of emotional, relational support. It wasn't even about the religion initially. Wow. And I do, I do want to say, I think a lot of people are drawn into some of these religions and mystery cults, not first based on face value of what they're preaching and teaching, mm. but just on community. Wow. So there I was at a black campus and for some reason still feeling very isolated wow. and alone. And that was a family for me. And mm. so it was a slow progress. Like I really believe when the scripture says, you know, you walk not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stand in the way of the sinner, nor sit in the seat of the scornful, yeah. that sin is progressive. Mm -hmm. And so there were just things about my spiritual life that started to wane. So where I initially was taking like the bus, every Sunday there was a bus that would pick you up and take you to church. Yeah. I was doing that whole thing, not really having community at the church, but just being in the house. Yeah. Um, so instead of going to church on Sunday, now I'm doing yoga on Sunday mm. at this place. Um, and then I started getting into African dance. So all of this is happening at this hub and I'm enjoying it. So I had a, a background in dancing, but now I'm doing African dancing. Mm -hmm. And then I start, you know, changing how I dress mm -hmm. and slowly 
Um, I never thought I was divorcing myself from Christianity, mm -hmm. never thought I was divorcing myself from Christ. What I discovered is that in order to maintain the fellowship and community I had gained, I needed to dim my light on Christ. Mm. They never came right out and said, we don't want to hear nothing about that Jesus mm -hmm. stuff. But I do have very distinct memories of interjecting something about my faith or interjecting something about the Lord and either getting crickets or frowns or dismissive looks mm -hmm. and just subtly learning that if I wanted them, they didn't want anything to do with the Lord. And so I had to suppress the truth. Mm. And so that was the beginning of my undoing, so to speak. Um, and so really, I think it came, the, the biggest thing that I would say that was kind of the thing that reeled me in was I, it was kind of like how Eve got set up by the serpent, feeling like God had denied her some yeah, truth yeah. and some information and the questioning of my faith um, and the fact that they seemed to understand the Bible that I thought I understood and so much more. Yeah. I really started feeling like, how did I get to this town in Tallahassee? And they've got all this truth on my culture and the origins of even Christianity. Mm -hmm. They know so much about who I am as a black woman and as an African woman that, that I was completely clueless about. Yeah. And I had felt like the, the church that I had grown up in, what my parents had given me was half of the story. Right, right, right. My parents were very socially active, especially my father, and I felt like I knew about black history from the civil rights movement up mm -hmm. till the present. Yeah. But I knew nothing really about Africa. Wow. So I didn't even have a litmus test to even judge the veracity of the truthfulness mm -hmm. that I was receiving. So I was like a deer in headlights. And I just felt like, you know, from studying things on the boule and Illuminati and the New World Order and behold the pale the, horse, all, all behold the pale horse Yellow and the ISIS Africa. papers. <laughs> and I mean, I was into all of that and studying Steve Coakley's yeah. teachings. Yes. And so, yes. so it was like a gradual. And I'm just thinking, like, wow, the church is lost. Yes, they're missing a lot of critical information. And then, even when you think about Egyptology, for someone to be able to take the stories of my faith yeah. and tell me they're written on hieroglyphics in Egypt, and then the white man came and turned it around and messed it up and I'm just sitting there thinking like oh my goodness I've been duped I've been brainwashed and and so but I never actually thought I have to Christ wasn't a part of that I was trying to merge Christ into it gotcha so if I were to even give you a glimpse of what that looked like on in the early stages so I was encouraged to set up an altar in my home. Mm -hmm. So I had an altar in my home with, you know, elements from the from water and, and the earth and things that represented air wow. and fire. I was encouraged to take pictures of my ancestors because mm -hmm. ancestor worship and uh, and regard and praise is a high thing yeah. In, in, yeah. in a lot of these religions. So I had pictures of my, my poor grandparents on on my altar and I had candles and Wow. And I even had a cross. Wow. I even had a cross. And interestingly enough, over time, I would pray. and But I, I was going from like praying to God to being encouraged to pray to the ancestors mm -hmm. for strength and revelation and direction and guidance. So they became your mediators. They became my mediators. Yeah. Absolutely. And I don't even remember how or when, but eventually the cross is no longer there mm -hmm. on, on the altar. Um, in doing this, so I was exposed to Yoruba and some cultures, Santa Maria. Explain, explain those two in brief. Okay, so basically in the Cuban culture it would be Santa Maria and, and Yoruba is from Nigeria. They're Yoruba people, but then there's Yoruba religion mm -hmm. where they um, look at the Orishas as the gods and goddesses that guide us, that are involved in human affairs. And so when you're practicing Yoruba, someone kind of discerns based on your character, your, your personality, your appearance, kind of what is your dominant god and goddess. So I was called Oshun, which was the god of love and fertility and healing and sexuality and all that kind of stuff. And now, I was, let, now let me say something right here um, <laughs> while you're doing that, because... I want to. I want to. You get to the that part. I want you. You know the the, okay. the priestess part. But so one of the things you know in thinking through all of this is a lot of people don't know that it's nothing wrong with appreciating your history and those who came before mm -hmm. you when you talk about. But there's a difference between ancestral worship, mediating between you yes, and God or absolutely. the gods, yes. 
yeah. um, because there's only one mediator. Mm -hmm. And so, or but having even power, absolutely, and, 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 and them imparting their powers to you. Mm -hmm. But the other thing to think about, you know, is like in, even in Deuteronomy 13, I had a family member um, said that they had a, you know, you know how African Americans we still have some of the religiosity of Africa mm -hmm. within our folk theories. Mm -hmm. Like I have Gullah people in my family. I have people from Trinidad, and they brought some of the religions over. And then even some of my all my family from South and North Carolina. And so um, one family member said, man, um, you know, so-and-so visited me. And I was like, who? And, I was, and he was like, um, my wife visited me, and she came, and she let me know she was okay. I was like, okay. Mm -hmm. and, so, and, and we started talking through that. And I said, I said where would you, you say you're a believer? Yes. I said, so, so talk to me about in the Bible there being an ancestor coming back to talk to you. Mm -hmm. it, it like... And we began talking, and I had to walk them over to Deuteronomy 13 to talk about familiar spirits mm -hmm. and how demons insert themselves mm -hmm. as ancestors, family members, as a way to develop a familiarity to you in order that you may not see them as off limits or a challenge or something that could be detrimental to you, but something familiar that will make you give them spiritual foothold in your life. Absolutely. And so as you walk through that and as you begin to like Christianity gets pushed off mm -hmm. and then now as Christianity gets pushed off and as you begin to embrace and we'll just say indigenous religions mm -hmm. what what was what was it like for you emotionally mm -hmm. what was it like for you intellectually and then how did you look at Christianity and Christ at that point yes so emotionally i think i had a a warped and false sense of power mm. and strength um, I felt like uh, it also made me very arrogant and self-righteous mm -hmm. toward Christianity. Wow. I remember coming home for like the breaks for, you know, and my whole appearance changed. Wow. I don't even know if my parents or my church even knew what to make of it. They probably just thought she's going through a phase. She's in her black. Because I was wrapping gaylays and wearing grand bobos and just all of the African traditional garbs. I'm not wow. even talking about dashikis. I'm talking about... Oh, you was on some of, next level. Yes, bracelets yeah. up to my arm. Everything had a meaning, didn't e it? Everything had a meaning. Yeah. Every color had a meaning. <laughs> and I was wearing colors that were yeah. supposed to be associated with my, my god and goddess types. Now, let me say this as, a, as she's saying. I'm in mean, control. Mm -hmm. But we're not demonizing African culture. No, no, now, no, I, no. I just want us to make sure that people understand... We're not demonizing Absolutely. cultural appreciation. But I'm, I'm sorry, go yeah, ahead. Which, yep, and, yep. And, I mean, I know I'm kind of jumping forward a little bit, but part of the redemption that the Lord brought to my life after it meant me having to relocate what it means to be a black woman, an African woman, and appreciate the things from my culture and disassociate all of the ungodly parts that I had participated in. Mm -hmm. So for a long time, I wasn't really comfortable doing African dance because of the connections that it had. I wasn't comfortable with wearing certain clothing or even having certain artwork that I'm now able to have in my home because then the association was so tight. So I had to make such a break. Well, that's what so, that's that's First Corinthians eight yes. and nine. That's that's what. He, that's literally what Paul is talking about there. Yeah. So yeah, but I'm sorry, go ahead. So, yeah. um, so yeah. emotionally, I, I think I had a false sense of superiority. Mm. I think my anger toward white people increased mm. in a way that was, wow. I mean, like I thought I was angry before. Yeah. I was really angry now. Um, even anger toward black people because I started to think that if you were black and didn't know this or were Christian, it was like you were pathetic and how could you believe this white man's religion and y'all need to study and y'all have a version of the truth that's not the whole truth. And so in some ways, it's it's not even evangelistic in the sense like you're trying to get people to truth. You're mm -hmm. just downing yeah. them. You're yeah. not, so, and so it just was filled with a lot of anger. Um, I think... Um, um, even on a on a psychological level, I was just gone. I, I mean, it is nothing but the grace of God that I even finished school because I I don't even remember really being connected to the schoolwork wow. that I was doing um, during that time. Um, and the other piece of it that also kind of entraps you is there was this strong social justice aspect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's this strong like return to nature and um, <laughs> eat healthy and you know don't be commercialized and all that kind of stuff that is also a draw. Um, and so 
when you're confronting, confronted with all of the ways in which we were sick as African Americans and ways in which Christianity um, was not completely or fully being taught, you know, in my own church and in the lives of so many people, yeah. it, it made sense. To, their version of the story made sense. So along the journey, I was deemed to be someone that had the, the calling, the power, the, the basically, I guess, the call to be uh, a Yoruba priestess. Wow. And was talked to, talk to about maybe going through initiation, mm -hmm. um, even to the point of maybe going to a village and having the tribal markings carved in my face. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, I was doing ceremonious stuff, uh, dedicating pound cake to the ocean. I was taking baths in honey. I was throwing Kyrie shells and supposed to be reading whatever the, the gods and spirits were articulating to me. I got involved in tarot card reading. I remember when I went to purchase my tarot cards, I went to this shop. I was given the address on where I could go. And I was talking to the people. It was a bunch of white ladies in there running the shop. And it was weird. It was like a weird like shop. Had crystals all around. But I was there to get my tarot cards. And they were like, yeah, hi, we're witches. Like, they were like witches. Mm -hmm. Wicca. And I'm thinking, this doesn't look like the witch. You know, I have never, I mean, the naivete of my life about all of these things. So I'm like, this looks like just regular Becky Sue. And she, she's talking about she's a witch. Mm -hmm. So it was just shifting my young mind around all the concepts that I had about what was supposed to be ungodly and we were supposed to stay away from and they were really just into nature. So it was just hard for me to digest. I had one experience, um, I think I shared with you before, just, I, I mean, I just don't know how the Lord used even the folly of my life to still be, um, to still speak to people. I had a friend who came to me one time um, after I'd gotten out of it years later and said, Sarita, I just wanna thank you. Um, she showed me a picture of her daughter, and she said, my daughter would not be here if it wasn't for you. And I'm like, what are you talking about? And she said, do you remember that time I came over your house <laughs> for a reading? Mm -hmm. And I was like, uh, okay, yeah. She was like, you folded down the cards, and there was a card with a pregnant woman and the son, and you told me that I was pregnant with something that I had to give birth to, and you didn't know that I was pregnant and getting ready to have an abortion. Mm. And it's interesting because, you know, you got in the Bible, the witch of Endor, that actually, I believe that was actually Samuel, that God allowed to come up and give a proper prophecy. Oh. Some way, shape, or form went back down. You had, I mean, you, you have that as, as, a, as a, and then you got Caiaphas, the high priest, who wasn't even a believer, who prophesied and didn't even know it. Yeah. And so it's just, and then God used a, a donkey to prophesy. I'm not calling you a donkey, but right. I'm just saying, yeah. um, <laughs> you know, I'm just saying that. So this, so it's interesting. <laughs> so when did things come to a head? And then yeah. I want to, I want to go, I want to talk about speed up to now, but sure. what, what would you, what, what, what came to a head that, that yeah. was the come to Jesus moment, if you will? Well, I think there were a lot of things going on behind the scenes that were bringing it to a head that I didn't know about. So apparently, someone from FAMU observing my life had contacted my parents and pretty much was like, Sarita is out here tripping, <laughs> right? And uh, I don't even know if my parents could appreciate what she was trying to explain to them. I know they had no idea that I was into like some other religion and mm -hmm, all of that. Mm -hmm. But my dad um, would call my answer machine. This is back in the day when you had the answer machine with the tape. Yeah. And I would come home from school, go in my apartment, and I would push play. My dad wouldn't even be like, hi, Sarita, how you doing? Calling to check on you. I would push play, and my dad would be like, in the name of Jesus, God, I plead the blood of Jesus over Sarita's life. Yeah, 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 I rebuke yeah, yeah. every demonic force. <laughs> <laughs> and this is like my dad is just like praying and praying and literally at the time I'm looking at the machine like oh my gosh seriously dad but my dad consistently would call and pray mm. and then we would have conversations and talk and I mean he never I don't know if he didn't know what to say or how to approach it because I didn't break fellowship with my parents yeah. but we would talk and never really talk about that but I would get like these consistent prayers over my answering machine, he would pray out the whole tape. Mm -hmm. No one else could. So, I believe that my I have my family was interceding for me even without a full revelation and knowledge of what was going on with wow, me. Wow. Um, and then the the night, so to speak, that you know everything came to a head. I had had like this poetry reading get together at my apartment, um, and it was you know people were out in the living room reading their spoken word and so forth. 
and someone who had used the bathroom in my uh, bedroom came out and got me and said, Sarita, your dad just called and left a message and he's going to town praying and he was saying, you know, he wants you to call him. And so I, I go back to the room to, you know, check on it, see if he was still on the line. And I hear someone reading a poem in the uh, living room and in the poem at some point I just heard them say, F Jesus. And <laughs> it just, it was, it's literally, I don't even know how to explain what happened mm. other than I feel like the Holy Spirit was like enough. And I went, I guess, for what other people saw like ballistic. And I started kicking everybody out of my apartment and I was just screaming, get out, get out, get out. Um, and everybody's like, you know, what's wrong with you? But people, I mean, people just exited my apartment and I just grabbed. You went Martin Lawrence on the people, huh? I did. <laughs> I mean, and not like communicating, just yeah. like get out, get out, get out. I grabbed a big green trash bag. I took my arm and dumped everything off my altar into the trash bag. Different, you know, artifacts and things that were associated with the religion. I dumped in the trash bag, took the tarot cards, dumped them in the trash bag, took the Kyrie shells, dumped them in the trash bag. Just everything that was a trace of it that I had. And I'm just dumping stuff in the trash bag. I go out, walk out my apartment. And this is here, like the spooky part, because I had one of those key cards to my apartment that you had to have a key card to get in like a hotel. I left my apartment, no keys, no nothing, walked in the back, in the woods, threw the trash bag in the woods, walked back up and opened up the door into my apartment. Mm. No key. Mm. Let, let me, I, I need you to do something for me because this is a powerful story. I need you to, I'm, I'm going to do like the people on TBN do. I want you to look in the camera um, and I want you to basically Proclaim the gospel that you believed in two minutes to a person and plead a person that's particularly they're dealing with identity issues, significance issues, uh, uh, and all of that, and call them back to the faith. Mm. Amen. Um, this will be a perfect intro to share um, the word that God gave me. So after I came back from into the apartment, I like literally passed out in the bathroom floor. Mm. And um, when I woke up, I was looking under my bed. Mm. And in looking under my bed, I saw a Bible. Mm. I don't think I had re read the Bible in two years. Wow. And I didn't know what to read, what to do. And I did like the whole old school, like flip it open. And the, the Bible literally opened to the second chapter of Jeremiah. Mm. And the very first words I read was, I remember the devotion of your youth. Mm. Your love as a bride. Mm. And I just felt like in that moment, it was like the Lord was saying, come back to me. Mm. And I just continued to read all the way to the end, to the 52nd chapter of Jeremiah. Had never read the book in my life, and I just read and read. And I just felt the spirit of the Lord convicting me. You know, return from idol worship. Worshiping worthless things and becoming worthless because of it. And he was saying, if you return to me, I'll do this for you. Mm -hmm. um, but if you continue in it, you're going to be destroyed. Mm -hmm. And I believed, I felt like the Lord was saying, this is going to destroy you if you don't come back to me. And I read and I read and I read and I just cried and I cried. And I didn't have all the Christian lingo around repentance and things like that. And I remember I just got up and I went into the mirror of my bathroom and I looked at myself and I was just talking to the Lord and I was just saying, God, I am so sorry. Mm. I am so sorry. And the Lord has said to me, if you deny me here on earth, I will deny you before my father in heaven. And I knew that this whole journey started with me denying the Lord, hiding my light under a bushel, suppressing the truth, for, for fleeting community and relationships with people who were really walking me to hell. 
And I just thank God that in that moment, I just said to him, I said, Lord, I'm sorry. I said, I'm sorry for being ashamed of you. I'm sorry for hiding from you. Sorry for not being a clear witness of your truth that I knew. And I said, God, I remember three things I said to the Lord. I said, Lord, I said, whatever you want me to do, I will do it. Wherever you want me to go, I will go. And whatever you want me to say, I will say. And I said, God, just do one thing for me. I said, I want to know you like I've never known you before. Mm. And I asked God to know him Mm. and the truth of who he was from the scripture. And after all of that, remember I started reading in the second chapter. I was like, oh, I never read the first chapter. Mm -hmm. And I said, wait, let me go back and read Mm. the first chapter. And the first thing I read is him saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet, not a divinator, (laughs) not a tarot card reader, Mm. to the nations. Then I said, ah, Lord God, behold, I do not know how to speak, for I am only a youth. But the Lord said to me, do not say I am a youth, for to all to whom I send you. You shall go, and whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. And then I continued to read about him putting his hand on his mouth. And I believe I didn't have the full revelation of it then. But I believe the Lord was calling me into my ultimate purpose, which was to be a minister of his word, to be a lover of his word, to be a a mouthpiece, an evangelist, to speak truth to the nations, to to declare the goodness of the Lord. And I just want to say to anybody that is ever struggling, let me say, the gospel of Jesus Christ saves to the utmost. And the gospel of Jesus Christ even comes and arrests you back and rescues you back when you have gone far, far away from God. Mm. And, and I just want to say that we are often led into a lot of things and in relationships with a lot of people because we don't feel loved, because we don't know who we are. We never had someone affirm us, or maybe you felt alone, and, and just being with anyone was mm. better than being with no one. Mm. But I want to say to you, the Lord is always with you, right? He says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And, and we have to reckon with this truth, that we are all all sinners shaped in iniquity and the only thing we deserve is death mm. all we deserve is to spend eternity in the lake of fire mm. but the word that rescued me is that on a hill called Calvary yeah Jesus Christ came into the world he came into the world the I, one of my favorite scriptures is this is a trustworthy saying divert deserving a full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners among whom I am chief Mm. That's my word. Christ came to save sinners among whom I am the worst. And see, when we get in touch with the depravity of our human nature and see that Jesus on the cross paid the ultimate penalty for our sin, that we don't need anyone to do the work for us. We can't even do the work for ourselves, but that Jesus died so that we could squash the beef that we have with God and be reconciled to him into a relationship that affords us not only the the abundant life on earth, but eternal life with him in heaven forever. And I'm so grateful to God, and I just want to encourage everyone who has strayed away, who has used religion and culture and the anger of racism and the anger of sexism and all the things that would cause us to want to search and grapple and grasp for more, that there is nothing greater that you could reach for but God. Mm. And no matter where you are today, you can go back. You can look at a mirror of your own life. Look at the mirror of the word and you can repent. Amen. You can repent. And Mm. God says he is faithful to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Wow. Wow. I have nothing else to say. God bless you. Amen. (laughs) 